Let's turn to Acts chapter 13 this morning. And as you turn there, you know, the, the longer you live uh, on this earth, and especially if you're in the Christian world, you often get opportunities to share from God's word. And especially uh, when people like us, we go to India or something like that, they often open the pulpit for us. Uh, not sure why, but uh, I guess something about us coming from America gives some credibility. So I had a, a, a moment like that. Uh, actually visited a, a seminary, uh, Kotaim Seminary, uh, early in our marriage. It was probably a few days after getting married. I think that's my, mem- my, mem- my memory serves me right. So um, I was asked to share like five to ten minutes uh, from the word, and I think it was our chapel, I think, um, and so there's uh, students from all over India, you know, North India, and and it was an English service, and uh, so I was nervous because, you know, this was, this was 11 years ago, um, my, maybe my understanding of the word wasn't as deep and such, and so I was very nervous, I was like, who am I to speak to these people, they they have given their lives for Christ, I'm here, you know, in the comfort, com- you know, comfort of America, and uh, so, you know, being newly married, my you know, the only thing that was in my mind was about my marriage, and so I, I started sharing a testimony of of how Vinita and I met, and so uh, to this day, it's a regret of mine uh, that I used that time to do that, because, uh, you know, if these men and women of God are there sacrificing all their whole life for Christ, then what is marriage when it comes to all those things? So why am I saying all of that is uh, we are at a point where we are uh, walking with Paul and Barnabas, uh, and we heard about John Mark last week. Uh, They're on their first missionary journey. Uh, They were sent out by the Holy Spirit, and Mark Mark is there just to assist. So, and we know that Mark later goes back to Jerusalem. We knew we talked about that quite a bit. So, um, now when we go to verse 13 of Acts chapter 13, uh, we see here that uh, they are given an opportunity to give an exhortation. And how does Paul, in particular, use that time? And, and we're going to see from what are the effects of that, that exhortation and what comes about and what we can look at in our lives to see, uh, look in our lives to see where we can change and where uh, the Lord wants to speak to us. Um, so we are uh, in Acts chapter 13 and 13, verse 13 onwards, 13 to 16, I'll read here. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came down to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And just to pause there, the Ant- I think I said Antioch, Antioch uh, in Pisidia. Antioch, um, we heard about the Antioch church. This is a different Antioch. In fact, there are 17 ancient cities in Asia Minor called Antioch. And so the Antioch in Pisidia is actually about 450 miles away from the Antioch that uh, we uh, studied about. Uh, and, uh, in, you know, the, the actual term for Antioch is Antokia, or in Malayalam, you know, we hear the Antokia, you know, Antokia. And if you are, uh, if you've ever been in, um, in you know, uh, in the... In the nominal uh, Christian world, you hear that quite often. So here um, they are in Antioch in Pisidia. On the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Verse 15. After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. So the, um, if you look through how the early apostles and disciples of Christ, they, when they visited the area, they would first go to the synagogues. And that is because, first of all, most of them were Jewish. Uh, and so that was a, instant, a place to start, you know, to start a ministry or start, a, start the word to spread. It, going to a synagogue was often the, the best place. And so here we see Paul and Barnabas doing the same. They went to the synagogue and, you know, there's some uh, theories on why 
the rulers of the synagogue felt like asking Paul and Barnabas to share um, a word of exhortation. It could have been because of the, you know, some say because Paul was still wearing his Pharisee garb. Uh, some say Paul was just well known uh, and or maybe they came to hear about his background of his education and all that and thought he would be qualified to give an exhortation. Uh, and so Paul uses that time. Paul, you know, it, they say, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement, please say it. And he takes that opportunity to preach the gospel. And so um, when we look at the, uh, the message itself, and I'm going to go really quick through that because uh, in a lot of ways, when we compare Paul's uh, message here to that synagogue, it's very similar to Peter's first sermon. Uh, and so, because there's a lot of repetition, I'm not going. To, we already covered that at length, so I'm not going to do that. But I want to point out uh, the God-centeredness of of his message. And I, you know, as we look through verse 17 onwards, just just go through the verses with me. Uh, I'm not going to read them, but. I'm just going to give you kind of a, a nutshell of the message. We see from verse 17 that God of this people Israel chose our fathers. God made the people great. God led them out of Egypt uh, with this up, uplifted arm. God put up with them in the wilderness. God destroyed the seven nations in the land of Canaan. God gave them their land as an inheritance. God gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. And God gave them Saul. And God removed Saul. And God raised up David. And finally, he says in verse 23, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Hallelujah. So God is at the center of the redemption story. We know this. And when we give any message and any exhortation, and when it comes to the gospel... The gospel is not about us. It is about God and his hand working from the beginning of time. And here Paul is faithful in his message to give God all the glory, to show the sovereignty of God, to lift up his hand in, in human history. So now when we go to verse 36, and I'm going a little bit quicker here because my message is actually a little bit towards the end. And we're, we're going to read uh, verse 36 onwards here. For David, after he had served the purposes of God, again, God-centeredness, the purposes of God. David is, uh, and we know this verse really well. It's a very uh, inspirational verse. When David, after he has served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and he was laid with his fathers and saw corruption, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Now, I skipped a lot of the portion where Paul is talking about Jesus here, so... What Paul is saying here is that Jesus is the better David. You know, Jesus, uh, King David served his uh, generation and served the purpose of God and died and he saw corruption. But Jesus, the better David, did the same and he was able to truly uh, be a man after God's own heart and he did not see corruption. So verse 38 says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man... Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, verse 39, and by him, Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. The word there, freed, if you uh, look at the, the root word, it really means justified. And, and uh, a lot of versions, they use the word freed instead of justified. And here we're seeing a that kind of the the stamp of Paul, because uh, those who, all of us who have studied the epistles, we know that you know if there's one thing that Paul is, that Paul is known for is the, is the you know the truth of the justification by faith. You know, so you know he's here, verse 39, he's saying that by Jesus, any everyone who believes, everyone who has faith, is justified from everything from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. If we flip to uh, Romans chapter 3, and I just want to read that because we're on the topic. Uh, Romans chapter 3, 20 to 26. And we'll read that portion and I'll make some comments on it. Romans chapter 3, 20 through 26. For by the works of the law, 
no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, this is verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This is to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show that his righteousness at this present time, so that he might be the just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. I would love to break down these verses, but time does not allow me to do that. But there is a tendency among us to think that we can be justified. And let me, let me explain that for our younger uh, brothers and sisters. Being justified is to be declared perfect and righteous before God. The truth is in verse 23, we see that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone, every single human being has fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. But there's a tendency within us to think that we are good enough. We think, and then I've had these conversations with folks, you know, they, they, they say stuff like, well, yeah, all this theology is great and all, and, uh, um, you know, people like to, you know, there are some talkers and writers and all that, but, you know, I think it's all about being a good person. You know, it's all about just, just be a good person, be good to, kind to people, and, and you know, these are people in the church that I'm, I'm talking about. And, um, you know, we know from the story of the young, rich young ruler this is a, a young man who was certainly much more holy than I was. Um, you know, from his response, you know, from the get-go, he says, Good teacher, what must I do to etern- learn, earn eternal life? And, and, you know, Jesus asks about, do you, do you follow all the commandments? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I do it all. I've done it all since my youth. Um, and uh, it's just that, then it says that Jesus looked at him with love and said, um, then, then, you know, sell all your goods to the poor and come follow me. And then it says that the young, rich young man felt sorrow because of his many riches. The interesting thing is when, when I, this is me just thinking, that when this rich young ruler came to Jesus, he came with some level of, um, he felt equal with Jesus, you know. This, calling Jesus just freely, good teacher. Hey, good teacher, I'm a good guy too, we're good. Uh, you know, how, how can I get, go, get eternal life? And he ex- probably expected Jesus to say, hey, bro, you're, you're in, you know, you're a good guy, you know, just like me. Uh, but what, what does Jesus respond when, when uh, the rich young ruler makes that comment? He says, who is God, good but God alone? Who is good but, but God alone? And Jesus is not saying, he's not making a comment about himself. He's trying to get to that person's heart and trying to, expose the sin in his heart. And this is exactly how it is for us sometimes. We've been in the church for so many years. We're second generation, third generation, Pentecostals, believers, Christians. And we think just by our own, uh, through osmosis, you know, uh, you know, just by sitting in the pews for all your life, you, um, you have done all that is good. You obeyed your parents. You have been a decent person. You haven't killed anyone, right? Uh, at least I hope no one has, you know, or you have, you have, a, uh, you have been nice to everybody, you've been kind to everybody uh, for the most part, you know, they're here, you know, slip-ups once in a while, you know, we make uh, all these, uh, you know, uh, rational, or we kind of uh, make excuses for a lot of our shortcomings, but in all that, what I'm trying to say is this, that when we are standing before God, who is alone good, who is alone perfect, we are always falling short. We'll always will fall short. And so this is why Paul emphasizes here that by Jesus, everyone who believes a simple faith in Jesus is justified. So that with the moment you trust in Jesus and you confess and repent of your sins, you are before the Lord. 
something happens that we can't even explain, that you're declared righteous before God. And that truth has been seen from, from Genesis onward. Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. This has been in there all of the Bible and uh, here we see the fruition of this. The Old Testament saints believed in the promised Messiah. We are looking back and we are trusting in his promise fulfilled in Jesus and saying, I believe in Jesus who has paid the price for my sin, who, has, who is my righteousness. Hallelujah. Going on, verse 40, it says, Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Verse 41. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. This is from Habakkuk 1.5. Um, this is, again, a warning for us in the church. We... We're so used to the, 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 the programs and the, the way things uh, happen, you know. For example, you know right after this is going to be praise and worship. You know after that, pastor uh, pastor's going to speak, you know, from the Word. There's all these things are just predictable, and sometimes you lose sight of the work that God is doing in our midst. And, and here it is a warning for us too. Know the ways of God. We need to, we need to have eyes to see the ways of God even today. And how the Lord reveals His ways, even today, is to the, those who are considered foolish, those who are considered poor, those who are considered humble, those who are considered broken. And He keeps His ways away from those who think that they're, that, that are, those who are proud and wise and privileged and, and those who think they have it all. This is the ways of God. God does not reveal His ways to those who, who, who uh, have it all. He actually reveals his ways to those who have come brokenhearted like a child before him. And God is here warning that you scoffers be astounded and perish. Just let that weight come upon your soul. So verse 42, let's keep on going. As they went out, the people begged that these words might be told to them the next Sabbath. And after meeting the, of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts of Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas and as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Verse 43, so they, you know, Paul, these, there are new believers popping up because of these exhortations of Paul. Uh, and they have a thirst for the word, verse 42. They, they, wanna, they want them to come back. And what does Paul and Barnabas say? He said, they, they tell them to, to continue in the grace of God. Because my time is running really quickly, that continue in the grace of God. That's important because sometimes we think grace is at the, at the point of salvation, but we ought to continue in this grace. There's a, there's a possibility of falling away from grace. In Galatians 5.2, there, there, the, the way that you fall away from grace is described there. And uh, I'll skip to, uh, yeah, I'll just read the whole thing. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You're severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but faith working through love. The way you can fall away from grace is that you can start in your, your walk with the Lord, it, believing and trusting in Jesus for your salvation. And then the moment that you feel like you have the joy of salvation, you have received salvation, now you start working out your salvation through works. And this is how we can fall away from grace. This is what happened to the Judaizers they started putting in rules that, no, you must be circumcised. They're telling the Gentiles, you must be circumcised in order to be saved. They started putting in laws and, and conditions. And, and here's what Paul, Paul is saying, that these laws, if you, once you try to justify yourselves by certain laws, you're cut off from Christ. 
verse 4. You have fallen away from grace. And so what does he say? By the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. And none of these things count for anything, but is faith working through love. So if you walk by faith, if you walk by the Spirit, if you walk in love, salvation belongs to you. In 2 Peter 1.3, Peter says, His divine power has been given us everything we need for life and godliness. So everything that we have for our godliness has been given by God. It is nothing from us, nothing that we do can enable us for godliness. It is a gift of God. This love that I talked about, this faith, and this, the Holy Spirit, all is from God himself. And those who go away from this, in 2 Timothy, Paul says that you're embracing a form of godliness without power. If you think your actions is what causes you to have good right standing with God, Paul is saying that you can have a form of godliness, but no power. You can walk your Christian walk without the Spirit of God. You can be a good person without the Spirit of God. You can be a good person without faith in Christ. You can be a good person even without love. You can fake it all. You can be a fake person with no sincerity. Verse 44, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what is spoken by Paul, reviling him. I really want to contrast this verse 45. I'm going to skip a lot uh, because of lack of time. I want to skip to verse 52. You'll see, and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Verse 45, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict and what was spoken to Paul and reviling him. Verse 52, the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. What a contrast. Jealousy. It's uh, uh, Jerry Bridges has a book called Respectable Sins and jealousy is one of those sins that we think it's okay. We, we, uh, it's normal. You know, oh yeah, I'm jealous. Um, but being filled with jealousy, you know, it, it, it is, it's a seed that grows into a tree. We cannot control once that jealousy overflows out of our life. We know the story of Cain and Abel. It caused the murder of Abel, innocent Abel. Joseph, his brothers sold him. Even Pilate, who was not godly by any means, perceived that when the high priest brought Jesus in front of them, he perceived that it was because of jealousy. And in Acts 5, we covered this. The apostles, because of the signs and wonders happening, the, the, again, the same high priest and Sadducees jailed them because of jealousy. They were filled with jealousy. And here again, we're seeing this filled with jealousy. There's so many things I can talk about. Let me, let me just say that you know, jealousy alone has ruined so many families Jealousy alone has ruined churches. Jealousy has ruined ministries. Jealousy has made many ineffective in ministry. Jealousy has, jealousy has created strife in the workplace. It brings about destruction. And we need to look in our hearts, search deeply in our hearts and see our tendencies. What happens when we become jealous of other people? We, we start slandering them. We start finding faults. We look at everything that they do and then we find, we, like, we think that, it's a, that they are completely fake. We create a whole story and a narrative about them. That's what jealousy does. It, it is demonic. As a 37-year-old guy, you know, I was thinking, uh, and I'm, I guess I'm hitting some midlife crisis here. You know, uh, uh, LeBron James is 37 or 36. Um, Mark Zuckerberg is 37. You know, Lincoln Riley, the OU football coach, is 37. And, uh, you know, they're all well successful. Um, and then you look at the spiritual world, I'm not naming names, but people 10, 15 years younger than me with so much maturity and knowledge of the word, preaching and teaching and, 
And over time, you start to realize, when you see, especially the younger ones coming up, you, you tend to have jealousy. It's a real thing. And when it comes in the, in the household of God, it becomes even more evil. So how, how do I do, how do I, uh, what do I do when jealous thoughts come? I crucify myself. I die to myself. I find my identity, my joy in Christ. Hallelujah. So the, the, in verse 45, these people are contradicting the words of Paul. Paul had a wonderful gospel message. It says that they're twisted his words. They're contradicting everything he said. They're saying the opposite of probably what he was saying. And then it says that they started reviling him. Contra- uh, they started slandering him. Isn't in this what happens to us? And let me go to the last verse, and I will invite the worship team to come forward. When the disciples, verse 48, let me just say that real quick. Verse 48, they, when the Gentiles heard that now the gospel is for them because of the rejection of the Jews, they started rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And many that were appointed to eternal life believed. And Paul and Barnabas were kicked out, kicked out of the city. In verse 54, 52, it says the disciples, these people that came to hear the gospel, these Gentile believers that joyfully received the gospel, they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And that word filled is actually a, a kind of a past continuous. There's no ending. It's a, they kept being filled. It's kind of, or they were continuously filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. When we see the gospel, when we see, when we see Jesus, our hearts are filled with joy. That is the greatest antidote against jealousy. It's the greatest antidote against missing the whole point. You know, there's Jewish people, and, and I didn't cover this in verse 27. It says that the Jewish people were hearing every Sabbath all the prophecies over and over again. Just imagine they're covering like, you know, Isaiah 53, and they're, they're talking about this, this suffering servant. And then just a few years ago, maybe not even... Uh, five years ago, you know, Jesus came and did the same thing. You know, just missing the whole point. Let us look to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the word that you gave us this morning, God. Lord, we come brokenhearted before you, Lord. We ask by the power of the Spirit. You will reveal Jesus to us, O oh God. The, from the youngest of young to the oldest of old, Lord, help us to see you, Jesus. Help us never to miss the point. After hearing so many messages and so many singing, so many songs, attending so many Sunday gatherings, help us never to miss the point. Help us to be filled with joy. To rejoice in the Lord always. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Even in the midst of trials, we can have joy. We know that, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that we will be continually filled by your Spirit. So that we can walk in this earth. We can walk in a, in a higher law. The law of the Spirit. pray for all of our congregations seated here, Lord God. Please continue to speak to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.